Don't change your mate, change your mind. You know the stories you tell yourself in the head can ruin your relationships, ruin your happiness, and even ruin your health? For reals, there's science, and I'm gonna tell you all about it on today's episode of Sex, Love, and Elephants. Thanks for being here. So I'm Dr. Cheryl Fraser, love that you're here listening to this show. And um, my personal professional passion and reason for being is to help all of us suffer less and enjoy life more. Not in some superficial, whoa, I'm running from shiny object to shiny object and buying all the things and now I'm happy way. But from the inside out, how to find happiness from the inside out, how to love what is, um, be more grateful with the extraordinary lucky lives the majority of us have. We're in the top 1%, 5% of people on the planet. We have drinking water that doesn't kill our children. We have places to live, roof over our head. We have access to education, unlimited really, if you can get an internet connection. We have so much, but why are we so darn dissatisfied so much of the time? And as most of you know, if you're a regular listener and if you're a new listener, hello, lovely to meet you. A lot of what I focus on is our primary romantic relationship. I know not everybody's in a romantic relationship, but research and stats indicate that even when you uncouple, divorce, break up, being widowed or, or uh, otherwise being separated from your person, that about 87 to 92% of people recouple. So the tilt of the program is toward how to improve our happiness, love, even our sexuality within our romantic relationship. But any one of you who are not currently in a romantic relationship, welcome, welcome, because basically everything I teach is relevant to you, whatever life phase you're in and whatever relationship phase you're in. Yes, even the sexuality episodes, you can apply most of that learning to your solo sexual life. But for today, I want to talk about how much misery we create in our own heads, don't change your mate, change your mind is the slogan for today. Let me take us back. I want you to think about a negative thought you had about your partner. If you're not currently partnered, you can pick a family member, someone at work, a friend, etc. But a negative thought, a moment of irritation, uh, discomfiture, uh, being pissed off, being disappointed, even being hurt. I'll give you a really simple example that tends to happen in my household. I have his permission to share this story. So my hubby, as many stellar qualities, but uh, as he's uh, happy to have me share publicly because it helps other people, he has suffered his whole life with very severe ADD, diagnosed as a little boy and then as a youth and then through his adulthood as well. He thrives at work. He's an excellent hard worker, huge art. All of his bosses and clients love him because there's structure there that works great for him. But he can be very forgetful and whatnot in regular life, even when he tries really hard and makes lists and reminders. So Here's something that happens too much in the uh, Fraser household, in my opinion. Ha! I walk in to do a bit of laundry and the I open the washer and it's crammed full with wet clothes, often that have been left in there for a day or two or three and they're smelling a little musty. Probably they need to be run through the cycle again. And then I open the dryer so I can put said wet clothes in the dryer, you know, pretty logical stuff. And you can guess what happens. The dryer is crammed full with a bunch of my hubby's clothes that are now super duper wrinkled because they've been in there for three days. And I'm like, whatever, dude, you're going to be the wrinkle dude. But more often than not, I have a moment of irritation or a moment of disappointment or a moment of judgment. I have a thought along the lines of, oh, for God's sakes, here we go again. Or I can't believe it. How hard is it to take the laundry out and leave it open for me? Or, oh, that's not very thoughtful. Or damn it, I could strangle him right now. So I've been doing a practice with the couples in my ongoing program. Uh, many of you know, I have a three month program I run once or twice a year. I'll be running it this fall, 2024. If that sounds interesting to you, get on the wait list. You can click below where you're listening and join the wait list, no obligation, but you'll be invited to some very cool free Zooms with me and whatnot in September, October, leading up to launching and kicking off in mid-October with my next group of couples. And couples who do that 12 week program with me um, some of them choose to join an ongoing monthly program. So in that program, we have a monthly challenge. And the monthly challenge my hubby and I put out this month, the month of uh, June, no, the month of July, was catch a negative thought and rewrite it in your head. So how would I do that? Well, here we go. Here's Cheryl walking into the laundry room, uh, finding that the laundry is well occupied and has been sitting there for days. And the thought is, oh, darn it, here you did it again whatever the negative thought is. And I can rewrite it to, I love this man. He's forgetful. How about I fold his dry laundry and put his wet laundry through the cycle again, if it needs it. And what does that do to me? Think about it. 
play a thought experiment right now. Pick a negative thought that you've had today. And if about anything really, but let's, if it's about your sweetie, bring up that negative thought. Oh, they're always late or um, they're never romantic or why don't we make love enough? Whatever it is. I'm not saying those things aren't necessarily legitimate. And I'm not saying that there might be times and places to discuss those and maybe create some positive change. A lot of what I talk about is how to actually create more closeness, more kindness, more cooperation, stepping up better, maybe even getting better at um, setting a timer so you remember to take the laundry up. I'm all for good positive change. But people, the misery in your head is in your head. If I'm upset, disgruntled, put off, put your own thoughts in there about the laundry situation. It's my problem, not my sweetie's problem. Now, wait a minute, you cry. He's the one who was forgetful. He's the one that put things in the laundry, left them there and it inconvenienced you. It's his fault. Well, is that really true? Is it his fault I'm upset about those small events? Is it his responsibility that my reaction to those small events is negative? Tell you what, no, it's completely not his responsibility at all. It's my responsibility. It's my responsibility how I respond to the events in front of me. This draws from Buddhist thinking as well as psychological thinking and plainly good old common sense because I did ask you to do a thought experiment, didn't I? I asked you to bring up a negative thought that you've had today and now I want you to rewrite it. So if the thought was, oh, they're always late, it could be, yeah, they tend to always be late, but it just gives me a few minutes to think about how sweet they are. Or, oh, they're always late. Well, it's okay. It's not great. I don't love it, but that's my sweetie. Uh, I use that phrase quite a bit. And my honey and I try to use that phrase quite a bit when we're thinking about something in the other's personality style or way of living their life or choices that we're not that crazy about. It's very different to respond to that thought by thinking, well, that's my sweetie instead of damn them anyway. So bring it back to the laundry room. Dun, dun, dun. Laundry room. I walk in, et cetera, et cetera. And if I think, well, that's my sweetie. What does that mean? It means I know my man has a heart of gold. I know his, his intentions are astounding. I know he would do anything for me. He is such an extraordinary support and cheerleader of all of what I do. The business, the couples program, this podcast, the videos, other ventures I'm involved in, going away for months at a time to meditate in silence while he holds down the fort. He's an extraordinary guy. That's why I love him. He's also not good with remembering daily tasks. So when I see the laundry sitch and I think to myself, darn him, stupid laundry, ah, you're so thoughtless or the negative thoughts, what happens in my physiology and my psychology is I don't feel so good. Maybe even you get a little bit of um, cortisol, a little bit of adrenaline, a little bit of a stress response. And a story in, in your head, let's spin this out a little bit. He's so thoughtless. Gosh, how hard would it be for him to switch the laundry? He knows how busy I am frantically trying to get ready for this trip. You should have known I'd need to do laundry. Oh, this is going to, you know, get in my way. It's cost me 10 minutes and I'm super busy. How does that story, even as I share it with you now, make you feel as you listen? Does it make you feel calm and happy and loving as in loving the person who left the laundry there? No, of course it doesn't. Now this is pretty common sense, but how many of you are living this way? Let, let's bring that down to realistic. How many of you are attempting to live this way? How many of you are attempting? I fall down and make mistakes dozens and dozens of times a day, but I attempt to work with my mind. I attempt to change my thoughts. I attempt to not allow a negative repeating story to take up room in my head and ruin my effing day to affect my physiology, my stress level, my emotional response to my sweetheart. So walk into the laundry room. There's the laundry. I think, ah, oh, darn him. He's so thoughtless. I don't feel good. I may carry that over. I may walk out, find him if he's at home and go, could you just change your damn laundry? I can't believe how thoughtless you are. Well, that was fun. That's fun for him. Then he may have a reaction of his own internally or verbally like, wow, I did 14 things today for this household. I built the fence and I took the cat to the vet and I made you a beautiful breakfast and I made you a beautiful cup of tea. And that's what you're focusing on, which arguably would be a pretty fair response. Rewind. I walk into the laundry room and I choose to have a different thought. Now, because I'm not a Buddha yet and I'm a human being, when I walk in, my first response, my first reaction actually might be, oh gosh, laundry, Rah. But I can then choose to respond differently. I can choose to rewrite the story in my head to, well, that's my sweetie, which in this case, as I've explained now, means 
He's forgetful. He doesn't mean anything by it. It's not malice. He does so much for me in this household. Let it go, Cheryl. Fold his laundry and go give him a hug and a kiss. So the other day I tried something new. I walked in and the laundry was there four or five days ago and I had a little uh, moment. And instead I just you know, put his laundry, folded it, put the other one in the dryer. And I came out and I said, I am so lucky to have this gorgeous, sexy, wonderful man who leaves his laundry for me to fold because it helps me remember how much I love you. And we laughed because he knew what I was doing, but it was also sweet. And it set a tone. What kind of tone? You can guess, of course. It set a kind tone. It set, it set a connected tone. It set a friendship based in love tone. And that's the tone I want us all to work hard to do. Now, here's some teaching on how hard it is to change your mind, how hard it is to change a conditioned habit or pattern. Think of it this way. Let's say they're excavating uh, for a house they're going to build next to you. And there's a giant pile of sandy dirt. I don't know, 20 feet high uh, on the, on the bare lot next to where you live. And you walk by it every day when you walk your dog dozens of times a day, let's say. And the weather's been dry and dry and dry. And then uh, an unexpected rainstorm comes and it rains and rains and rains. And what tends to happen when rain runs down a, a, a sandy, fairly compact hill of dirt? Well, what tends to happen is it starts to create rivulets that start to wiggle down and create a path, right? A, a bit of an indentation down that hill of sandy, rocky earth. So as you walk by, there's a few rivulets, maybe two or three kind of pathways that have naturally carved out by the bumps of the landscape of that pile of dirt. And it's created rivulets. And then it keeps raining. What happens? Does the rain evenly wash down from the peak of the hill of dirt to the bottom? No, it doesn't. It tends to favor the already slightly carved pathway of the rivulet. And it starts to go down those rivulets and they get deeper and maybe they get broader and maybe they turn into more of a ditch situation with quite a lot of water running down them, right? That is a really good analogy for how the human brain works. So in terms of creating a pattern, so if you have a pattern of checking your iPhone the minute you get up in the morning and it's on your bedside table. I'll do a whole nother episode on why that is so bad for your mental health, your focus and your life. But let's say you're doing that and you've heard from me or other people or read some books to make you realize checking my iPhone first thing in the morning stimulates my, my sympathetic nervous system, kind of jazzes me up, makes me a little anxious. It's distracting. It's not how I want to start my day. I'd like to start my day in peacefulness and connection with those I love, maybe having a nice cup of tea on the deck. And you want to change your habitual pattern of waking up, reaching for your phone and checking all your stuff that you check. Is it easy to change that pattern? Well, surprisingly not, because let's say you've done that habitual pattern more or less every day for the last three years. So we've got almost a thousand days, almost a thousand repetitions of that's just your habitual pattern. Neither bad nor good necessarily, but you've decided that's a habit you'd like to change. Same as me walking into the laundry room, negative thought, and then going rah, 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 maybe at my sweetheart. So what's the first thing you're going to do? Well, if you have any wisdom at all, and I know you do, you're going to not have your phone in the bedroom at all. You're going to maybe plug it in uh, out in your office charging station in your home office if you have one. So it's out of sight, out of mind. So when you go to reach for the phone, which you probably will for many, 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 many weeks, it's not there. Helps break the pattern. But the urge is still there. And so you may feel a desire to go check the phone. There's a lot of research to show how much dopamine gets released sometimes when you hear the bang of your phone. That's why mine are always off because I don't want to be addicted to the phone and I'm not, but et cetera, et cetera. The point is this, the rivulets in your brain, so to speak, like this analogy of the water running down that sandy hill, um, have created a pathway, which is the normal way, I'm going to stretch this a little bit, but the normal way your brain and your behavior are going to go. Your conditioned habit is to reach for the phone and check the phone. My conditioned habit is to get a little snarky when I see the laundry situation. So changing that habit means we need to effectively, back to the hill of dirt, create a deeper rivulet eventually. We need to divert the water going down the rivulets it's used to going down. So how would you actually do that with a hill of dirt? Well, you'd probably climb up the hill of dirt, be careful, don't get collapsed on, and take a little shovel with you, maybe a hand trowel, whatever, and you'd, you'd maybe scrape out a new pathway. And at first, probably not a lot of water would run down your pathway. Why? Because the other pathways, the other ditches are much deeper. 
But if you worked at it, you could start to divert some of that water down your pathway. You know how this plays out, more and more water, deeper and deeper. Eventually that ditch can be bigger, stronger, and a better habit, meaning a more powerful habit that the water's without thinking, so to speak, going to run down than the original rivulet. Da, da, da. So when you change a behavioral habit or a thinking habit, A, it's hard. B, it takes a lot of repetition. C, just because you scraped a small new rivulet pathway down the hill of dirt and sand doesn't mean the rain's going to always go there. D, therefore, you have to be on alert. You have to do a little maintenance, a little uh, redirecting, a little rerouting of the water so that it'll go down where you want it to go down. Clear, right? I know. It's actually fairly easy to understand, fairly difficult to do. Back to your own negative thoughts. Small negative thoughts is what we're tackling today. The big thoughts take a lot more heavy lifting. I go much more into that in my program. Also the book, Buddha's Bedroom, if you're interested uh, more about working with your mind to uh, help you be happy, especially in your love relationship, that's what Buddha's Bedroom is all about. If you don't know what that book is, it's a book I've written and it's actually pretty good. You probably enjoy it. Um, okay, I walk into the laundry room, rah, rah, rah. negative thought. When I'm on my game, meaning when I'm paying attention, when got my little shovel in my hand, right? To create a new pattern, so to speak. I will catch the thought and I won't let the thought dominate my freaking day. I won't let it be the boss of my brain and I won't let it send its spidery little nasty talons out so that I can say something unkind or critical or sarcastic to my sweetheart because he bloody well deserves better. So does your sweetheart and so do you. That's why in the work we cultivate on this podcast and in my programs, we all really work to be kinder to our partner, which is really hard. Uh, there's a researcher and clinician, uh, Carrie Riel, a colleague of mine, who coined the term basic marital hatred. Ouch. I've never yet had to really explain what that means to anyone, though. We recognize it, whether we suffer from it very often or not. There are times where the way your partner sips their tea drives you freaking crazy. Why what they say just puts your skin on edge, where you're so sick and tired of being around them. And this doesn't apply to everybody, but it applies to most people, at least occasionally, where you just feel almost a hatred, a distaste, a negative physiological reaction to your partner. Does that mean you're doomed? not necessarily. It means you need to figure out how to be kinder, how to change your mind state, maybe to have more time apart so you can appreciate each other and many of the things we talk about here on the show and in the programs. But for today, the theme is don't change your mate, change your mind. So instead of me trying tirelessly for 11 years to help my hubby be better at remembering to set a timer, et cetera, for himself to change the laundry over, he's not that successful about it all the time. He's got other timers. uh, He gets forgetful. And don't judge him because believe me, he tries really hard and I have my own quirks and I'm not that easy to live with either. So instead of changing my mate, either exchanging him for a new improved model or badgering him for another 11 years to change that habit pattern that's not super easy for him to change and sometimes he hits it out of the park and sometimes he doesn't, I can change my mind. I can change my interpretation of the meaning of the laundry situation. I can change my story from the negative bitchy one to a kind and compassionate one. I can make fun of myself when the mind says, oh, poor me, I'm the victim of the world because of the laundry situation. It is up to you to be happy. Let me not split any hairs here. You are the one who makes yourself happy or not happy overall in your mind. And that is a really novel teaching in a lot of ways for those of us in the West. The idea that we have more power than we think around our emotions and around our mind and thought is not a very well understood teaching here in the West. It's starting to improve. There's more information about this out there. But just because we have an emotion doesn't mean we need to indulge it. It doesn't mean we need to allow ourselves to be engulfed by it. And it doesn't mean that we should keep feeding the fires of that negative emotion by building a bigger and bigger story. For example, I walk in the laundry room. I see the laundry situation. I feel upset. I feel annoyed. And then I go uh, talk to my partner and tell him that he's really thoughtless and I'm really disappointed and can't he see how stressed I am. And all I need is the bloody laundry machine to be empty so I can do some laundry and holy smokes. And then um, he maybe gets defensive, which is not a t- not necessarily a terrible response when you're there getting attacked and he's defensive and he replies back a certain way. And then that doesn't go well. And then I go off in a huff and I take the dog for a walk and I spend 
part of the walk thinking about how ungrateful he is and how I do everything around here and he can't even handle the laundry. Oh my goodness, everybody. How well do you relate to what I just said? I bet you relate fairly well. I bet this does not sound entirely unfamiliar. We get to decide whether we feed the negative story in our head. Do we keep telling ourselves how lousy our partner is, how perfect we are, how we deserve better? If you do, you're going to be really, really unhappy a lot of the time. Now, let me be really clear. I'm a clinician and I'm a pretty damn good one. I'm not suggesting that by um, changing the story in our head, all of our relationship problems disappear, nor am I suggesting that we should ignore relationship problems and just tell ourselves, oh, well, the fact that my partner is out partying all the time and I never see him and he spends way too much money and he doesn't talk to me and we never make love and I'm super lonely, I'll just change the story in my head. That's not what I'm saying. The much deeper work I do is about working to tackle the problems at their source as well. So really it's a two-pronged approach to happiness and better relationship. One is to work with the couple and or yourself and your behaviors to have better communication skills, more loving interactions, to treat each other with more appreciation, love, passion, uh, have adventure dates and have some fun, pay much better attention to your lovemaking and, and really prioritize that beautiful part of being a, a couple. So it is about, on the one hand, changing and learning and implementing the sort of things I teach so that you have a much better relationship. But the other hand is about me, Cheryl, I'm 100% responsible for happy I am or not am in my own head. It's up to me to change the story in my head. It's up to me to own my crap. It's up to me to realize these small idiosyncratic things that are going to happen when you love anyone and share a home with them aren't the end of the world. And we can allow them to make us miserable, or we can just say, that's my sweetheart. The moral of the story today is this. Life is short. Don't waste so much of it stock in the minutia of the small, petty thoughts. I do too sometimes. It is so much more easeful, so much more fun, and I feel so much more happy and at peace and the better me when I can let things go and work on changing the story in my head instead of projecting the big false drama where poor Cheryl's the victim of the world and she's a saint, saint and he's a moron. Doesn't help. Doesn't help. Cut it out. Do yourself the favor of changing the negative thought and practice like the challenge I put out this month every day for 31 days. Myself, my husband, and all the couples in my ongoing program are practicing catching a negative thought, even just one a day, it can be a small one, and changing it to a positive thought. Why? Because that's the only way to replace the rivulets in your brain that are the conditioned patterns, the conditioned ways of thinking, the habitual ways of thinking, to replace them with better habits. Which brings us to today's love bite. Don't change your mate, change your mind. Happiness is an inside job. When we stop expecting our partner to make us happy all the time, we become a better partner, and guess what? We become a more happy, peaceful person. Until next time, I remain Dr. Cheryl Fraser.